have access to some boring subjects. Understand the risk to our country. Freedom brings people together. You're listening to the We Are Libertarians Network. Learn more at wearelibertarians.com. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. My name is Chris Spangle. It's so great to be with you today. And we are going to be talking about Afghanistan. This was a fun show to prep. It's nice to get back into like show prep this way about it's like everybody went back to 2005 politics this week and it just something felt so normal about it. Uh, so with that being said, we're going to break down what happened in Afghanistan after these words. Warning. This show is for adults by semi-adults. So the language is sometimes strong and offensive. Uh, I don't know what I said. Uh. Welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. Our goal is to help you sound smarter while talking to your friends. If you struggle to understand politics, we explain it from an independent libertarian point of view. With all of the irreverence it deserves, we toss out the screaming heads, put people before political parties, and give context to the news to make you think. Now, here's our host, Chris Spangle, a 15-year veteran of politics and media. Hey, welcome to the Chris Spangle Show. It is great to be with you. New day, new time, new experiments in action. Um, and I know, uh, l- listen, the, the, the Chris Spangle Show feed, I love podcasting. I've been doing this since 2007, uh, and I love to experiment. This is my playground, the We Are Libertarians podcast network, where I test everything out, learn lots of things. And so, you know, every like six months, I do try to do five days a week, and then I kill myself. And then after a month or two, I swear I'll never do it again. Um but we are going to uh, go through that cycle again. Thank you for joining me. And I know that consistency is the most important thing, and that is something that I often fail at in the Chris Spangle Show feed for a variety of reasons. But uh, I want to, you know, I'm doing the History of Modern Politics show. I'm doing the Liberty Explained show. I'm doing the Podcasting a Platform show. And then I do this show, right? Well, they're all me. Right. And this is the Chris Spangle show. So why not put those things in the feed? And so you hear them because trust me, the numbers here versus the numbers there are much, much different. Uh, And, you know, I was at podcast movement and I figured out that, wow, two hour shows really do. uh, I saw some numbers and like the impact between the like, am I going to listen to this new show? Because most people have between seven and ten shows on their podcast app and you're fighting to be one of those seven. And uh, the Chris Spangle Show is in that seven for many of you, and we thank you so much. And for new people who don't give us a chance, that two-hour mark often is a a barrier. So we're going to continue to record on Saturdays, do two shows, split our normal show into two parts, and air that on Monday and Tuesday. And then Wednesday will be the podcasting show, and the goal of that is to help people build their own media company, build your own platform, start your own podcast, there's never been a better time to to get started, launch something, get your voice out there, especially as social media goes away. So I want to teach people how to do what I've done here over the last, you know, 10 years that we are libertarians and 20 years in radio and, and libertarianism. And then Thursday is our Liberty Explained show where we at, we solicit your questions. So make sure you send us questions at editor at we are libertarians dot com and we'll answer those in a, a short little bit. And then the the history segment will be on Fridays. So I'm going to interview a lot of uh, cool professors. We had scheduled uh, one person who I don't think is coming today uh, about the fall of Saigon. Um, but uh, we will have something on Friday that is history related. So i uh, going to just try this out and see how it goes. I am dangerously close to being a full-time podcaster. And I think that if I am consistent and diligent with this schedule then i can kind of get over that hump and uh and basically make a living at this and that is truly astounding to me and i am so appreciative to the people who listen to our ads the people who advertise the people who are in our patreon uh and the people who buy my consulting for podcasting i i uh for the last year or so really the last three have been on the side doing podcast consulting, helping people start podcasts, running podcasts, uh, and all that income basically has given me a a really good. Uh, I've been able to pay for a wedding. I've been able to pay for a ring. Um, been able to pay down a lot of debt. 
And once I can be debt free, then uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go here. So and that doesn't happen without our pay, our patrons. You know, I talked about it in our episode at the pool party. But the belief by our patrons, the people who subscribe to Wall Plus in this network, in building this new institution, because like I always say, don't run for office. Start an institution, start a nonprofit, start a business. I am st I started a media company and uh, I 50 years from now when hopefully I'm still around uh, people will look back and uh, it will be our patrons the people who have really invested in the growth of this network that have made that possible and especially our $100 a month members John Pusillo, Casey Feldposh, Lars Nordskog, Jakey Dell, Matthew Durbin, Reinhold, Christy Avery and Jason Doolittle and I would not be able to build an institution without great friends and partners and people that, you know, are on this show week in, week out that, you know, entertain you and great co-hosts like Harry Price. Harry, thank you so much for being here. How has your week been? It's been a whirlwind of a week. Um, like you said in the opening, it's like it's 2005 again. This is weird. Is, right? Like, <laughs> it's been so confusing because, Reinhold, everybody has political dysmorphia I, they don't know where they stand anymore they they the conservatives who are like arguing against themselves like i've seen friends who were bloodthirsty neocons and were screaming at me in the 2000s about not you know not interventionism is terrorism in and of itself and those people are like well why are we still there let's get out like and then the the, the democrats these democratic friends that i had that were like we need to pull out of the war. I'm anti-war. Now they're like, send in the troops. <laughs> it's very, very confusing for people because over t this war has lasted so long that people's opinions on it have shifted to the other side. Well, and it, it's not so much that they sh shifted. It's more a case of, I think a lot of times it's like, what are our enemies saying? And let's take that opposite position. Right. So as soon as the, as soon as the positions start to shift, everybody sees that and jumps the other way and tries to try to point out where the other people are wrong. So they, they paint themselves into these positions that are basically hypocritical on their own side, like their own, what they've said before, but it's, you know, everybody has short memories. And so they, everybody just does what they want to do. Yeah. So you, you got into, you get into that by pointing out who voted for the war and who didn't. And some, <laughs> some very, uh, it, it turns out that Barbara Lee <laughs> was right. people. Yeah, some very dedicated I, people uh, <laughs> didn't like that you pointed that out, but I, I unfollow my own post, so I have I'm totally unaware what anybody said. But uh, listen, when it comes to non-interventionism, uh, you know my own personal history, it goes back to 2008 and the Ron Paul campaign in 2007. I, you know, I think everybody was influenced by that. Uh, uh, you know, I was I was very libertarian while I was a Republican and that was the one piece because, you know, I was, I turned 18 two days before nine 11. It was a profoundly impactful day for me. Uh, it was, uh, you know, I think everybody at the time agreed that we should go into Afghanistan in one form or another. And, and it wasn't so much of what's going on with like the vaccine debate and the pandemic and the intensity of it and the social pressure you know, if a lot of people are in the situation where if they get the vaccine, then their anti-vax family is going to disown them. And if they don't get it, the other side's going to disown them. You know, it's highly polarizing and and people kind of uh, it, it's it's incredibly uh, there's a lot of social engineering going on. Yeah, it's it's and polarizing you, because people want it to be. That's that's how they're trying to make political gains is by setting people at each other at an emotional level so that they don't have to think about it. Yeah, but. and and so there's this is the the only other time in my life where this aggressive feeling of social pressure, right, existed was during that time period after 9/11. I mean, we we you know, I think it was September 18th when the AUMF, the Authorization of Military Force Against Terrorism was passed September 18th, you know, 7 days after and only bar i think it was uh it was the authorization for military force in afghanistan i'm i'm 
don't want to say it was the same vote, but only Barbara Lee voted against it, a Democrat from California. Ron Paul voted for it, right? Um, and that tells you, I think, how intense the pressure was at the time to go into Afghanistan. Now, long story short, you get to the debates and I see Ron Paul talking about non-interventionism and it was incredibly impactful to me. It completely, I mean, I'm the guy who put together a pro-war rally uh, <laughs> and I wonder if I have it uh, publicly available. I don't think I have because people who who don't listen to this show who has have an opinion of me that is usually just, uh, it may be, let's see. Just like that. Oh, you said the photo with you on stage with all the people around you. Oh, yeah. Right. Oh, oh, I was kicking anti-war protesters off the stage. Yeah, it's unlisted. You guys can't. You guys can't see it unless I show it to you. That's okay. Um, but you yeah, I mean, I was very, very pro-war. <laughs> Sorry, that sh uh, Shenandoah. This was the logo that we had designed for it. I was the College Republicans president at the time. Uh, and we were uh, just trying to do something nice for the troops that were already in Afghanistan. A uh, guy put together a video for it. You know, it was... Let me turn this down here a little bit. You know, it was it was a pro-war rally, but it was a, a Thanksgiving for the troops. This is the day after Thanksgiving. It's a support rally on the Monument Circle in downtown Indy uh, in 2003. Andy Horning uh, spoke at it. A uh, mentor of mine. Uh, let me see if I can find my uh, silly, goofy self. But you see, it was a big production. You know, mothers, oh, of, mothers of the military. You can see your head popping in the background. You know, we had congressmen. Uh, that's Larry Boris, who was a state legislator. All the Republicans wanted to speak at it. Uh, we had Sammy Davis. There's here's me. Here's me. This is more for the families who are here today. Uh, they sacrifice a lot. And none of us, if we don't have family in the military, can't understand the agony that they go through on a daily basis. Look how fat I was. I want to thank the Wright brothers for the fantastic music they're providing. So, so it was a big production, um, you know, and uh, it it was. Uh, I'll put it in the show notes. The un un uh, the unlisted video, so you can watch it. And check it out. And it was, I will say, I'm, I am very proud of it in the respect, that, in, in the way that Indianapolis was all lit up for Christmas at the time. We had taken these videos and put them on VHS tapes and DVDs and sent them to troops and care packages, you know, several hundred copies. And um, got many great letters from soldiers saying, you know, you have no idea how homesick I am and how how great it was to like get to see the city at Christmas time and and we really appreciate it so I, I am very proud of that even if the sentiment behind it was uh, mostly wrong so yeah well, was, Harry's right thank God you grew the beard but you know I mean when I, you were in the military Reinhold I don't know if you were a non-interventionist at that point like after 9-11 it was very difficult not to want to go get the bastards and whatever way we're going to do that let's do it Right. So I was um, I was non-interventionist uh, long before 9-11. I think I kind of as many a, soldiers are out, the number yeah. one group of uh, likes on our 100,000 person Facebook page is mil is veterans. Right. So, um, you know, I, I identified as a libertarian in like the early 90s. That's when I first heard about what libertarianism was. I realized, oh, that's what, what I did. Think, you stop. You know? so, <laughs> So I, I kind of had come to, the, to come to my own conclusion of what I, I I remember saying to somebody I said you know I just want the government to leave everybody alone uh, just protect protect us from hurting each other but otherwise leave us alone and somebody said oh it sounds like libertarianism so I went and looked it up and that's you know kind of where I started my journey there so I was doing political writing at the time so I I I switched over and started doing more more writing about libertarianism. Um, during that period so leading up to the to 9 11 i was very much anti you know intervention um you know i remember the first gulf war and how that came about and and everything so i was kind of against all of that and and some decisions that were made there but uh, i actually wrote an article defending 9 11 and the, and the decision to go to iraq right and, and what was funny about the time too is that i remember right after um, 
right after the attack and people were talking about what we're going to do. And Bush said he wanted to go to Afghanistan because that was where the Taliban ban was. And that's where all this was kind of developed from or, or planned from. Um, and they were giving him protection. So let's, let's go there and get those guys. And the Democrats at the time, some, one of the Democrat senators, and I don't remember the name. I need to go look it up. Um, but he said that we're going to give him one. We'll give him one war. And so they all agreed to support the Afghan Afghanistan. So when he started to go to Iraq, of course, that's when the Democrats were like, no, you can't go there. Yeah, right? and, so and, and, it was just as much justification. It was just yeah, as I mean, much justification to go to Iraq that there was in Afghanistan. But it's the Democrats who said, nope, that's enough. We gave you one. You're not getting another one. Yeah, I mean, Darla rightly says Biden voted for the war in Afghanistan as it was 98 to zero and like 425 to one in, you know, in the decision to go to Afghanistan. It was much more controversial to go to Iraq, um, but Biden voted for the war in Afghanistan, but said whenever we ended the Afghan war was it was going to end badly. So Biden voted for a war he always knew was going to end badly. He was head of the Council on Foreign Relations at that point. He was head of a Senate Armed Forces Committee at the time famously didn't really hold any hearings pushing back on the invasion of Afghanistan. Um, but somewhere along the way became one of the more rabid anti-war Democrats. And, and if you read Barack Obama's autobiography, um, Ryan Lindsay told me this, I didn't read it, but uh, it basically says like, and I remember this at the time, like Biden and Obama were on the outs because Obama wanted to greatly escalate and have another surge in Afghanistan, and Biden was really against it. And Scott Horton gave a fantastic interview. It's in the show notes for this. Uh, you know, talking about this interview and book, uh, there these burn pits. If you watch The Outpost, like if you're gonna watch one movie, uh, there's a couple movies I, I uh, recommended. One that's like Brad Pitt, like War or some War's in the title, but it's on Netflix and. Brad Pitt, Pitt plays this general and it like shows the dysfunction of why this didn't work so well. But the outpost shows what it's like for these soldiers in Afghanistan at the time. Fantastic movie, but they're burning, you know, they're burning feces, they're burning their trash. And one of the guys says, this is going to be the Agent Orange of this war. It's going to give us all cancer, burning all these polycarbonates and all this junk. And he was right. And Bo Biden, his uh, Joe Biden's son, was in Iraq around these burn pits. And that is what is believed to have given him the brain cancer that killed him. And so, you know, when Joe Biden comes out this week and sounds like Ron Paul, I mean, listen to this. Uh, let me pull it up here on the shared screen. So uh, the folks on YouTube can see it. You know, when he, when he uh, says this, I mean, he sounds like Ron Paul in 2008. How many more generations of America's daughters and sons would you have me send to fight Afghans, Afghanistan civil war when Afghan troops will not? How many more lives, American lives, is it worth? How many endless rows of headstones at Arlington National Cemetery? I'm clear on my answer. I will not repeat the mistakes we've made in the past. Wait. I mean, he was so dead on with that. I mean, he was uh, parts how, of that speech really good. How much is what happened to his son playing into that, too? He's had to go right. through that grief, right? So um, he feels that, like more on a personal level because that was that's that's one of his big motiv motivations in life is his family and his kid, his son. So mm -hmm. um, just the, he, so I know that he had a big thing with Obama. They he, he fought all the time about this. He wanted everybody out of Afghanistan. And everybody knew going in it was going to be bad. It wasn't just him. Everybody <laughs> knew we were never going to get out clean because we saw what happened to Russia when they did it. You know, why are we repeating that mistake? Uh, that was the big argument at the time. And we just they decided we were going to go do it. Yeah. So I we're going to was still flush a little bit from the first Gulf War about how easy that was or seemed yeah. to be. Because uh, we were leading up to that war. It was the comments that well, Iraq has the fourth largest army. This is going to be a bloodbath. We're going to have a lot of debt, you know. And then we just went in there and just, you know, steamrolled. Yeah, it was it was like 40 days or something like that. We had just we bombed them so much that they were just giving up. My my uh, my fiance is 27. I'm 37. Nice. 
uh, it is impossible for me to explain to her what life was like before 9-11 because she was eight. It is impossible for the three of us to explain to these kids what what life was like before the war on terror, before PRISM, before taking your shoes off at the airport, before, you know, it, it, it's the, the, the psychology before that was mm-hmm. we were invincible. We defeated the Soviet Union. We had defeated Saddam Hussein in days. And it then these, these, these hillbillies from K- Kabul or places we've never heard are going to come over here and blow up our towers and mop the floor with you. We're, you know, we're the, we're the sole superpower. Yeah. Um, yeah just try to, to, to tell people that, our airports were more like malls here in right. America. Like you could, like especially the Indianapolis one. Like it was a, it basically part of the uh, a Simon Mall. It, I remember going there as a teenager on the on the bus, get there, hang out at the airport, watch planes going off, and go to like and th- shopping there. Getting on the airplane was the, like yeah. getting on the airplane was like getting into the State Fair or a concert. Now you just walked through a metal detector. Mm-hmm. And yeah, when you went even, to the state fair, you didn't have to go through a metal detector. Yeah. And you didn't really have to at the airports when I was growing up. Right. So that's kind of a newer thing too. Uh, you used to be able to go to the, to the actual gate and see people off. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, you didn't, you, you didn't, you didn't have to have a ticket to get past a certain area. You know, it was just um, right. a whole different time. I grew, so I grew up at the end of the Vietnam war. Damn. Um, and Kevin then it Hart was just back. years and years of peace. And I remember when I was in the Navy that we there was a big push by Reagan at the time to revamp our military, revamp our Navy and make it stronger again. Cause we had, we had kind of, you know, tailed off a little bit on building that part of the, uh, the military branch up cause we didn't need it. Um, so that was kind of a big push at the time, but it was still less than what we saw. You know, it was, it was still a time of peace. It was still, relatively peace and we still had these things happening the coal and the beirut and all that stuff was going on but it was never you know like a big war engagement like we have now and it's just it's it's just sad to see for 20 years just sitting there watching this happen and people just don't remember what it was even like so it's this they're normal yeah Um, it's sad to me So we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, we're going to give you kind of the lead up to the uh, war in Afghanistan and kind of how we got into Afghanistan before we start talking about the Doha agreement and everything that's happened this week. Welcome back to the Chris Spangle Show. We are talking about the the, uh, before the forever wars. (laughs) We're talking about how we got into Afghanistan. Trying to help you uh, get the context. I know many of you, and when we had a live show on 9-11 years ago and Dakota was on, Dakota's in his early 20s still. Uh, that's how young he was. And he didn't even know. He We asked, who, who attacked us on 9-11? He goes, uh, Saddam Hussein? Right? Like, he didn't have any clue. He didn't even, you know, people don't... Harry, your mic just gets like super loud sometimes. It's really weird. Oh, I think it's. Hold on, I know what it is. I, I apologize. It's, it's the dock. I apologize. Hold on. Your get your dock under control, man. Um, so I don't think people have any idea what like the Taliban is or who they are or what happened. Um, uh, so we're gonna kind of go through a little bit of history and kind of give you some understanding of the lead up to Afghanistan, what the war was like, why. What, what kind of happened, and then tomorrow we're going to go into what happened this past week and, and the failure that was this entire thing. So, um, you know, the Taliban, and this is uh, part of Wikipedia here, uh, the Taliban, which refers to itself as the Islamic Emirate of Afghanistan, they're a militant organization that operates solely in Afghanistan, and they emerged in 1994 taking advantage of the power vacuum that was left following the aftermath of the Afghan Civil War. So the, uh, the the Soviet Union comes in and occupies Afghanistan. The Americans drew them into Afghanistan as a way to – so part of what Reagan's strategy was in defeating the Soviet Union was to get them to spend, spend, spend. So he, he increased military spending, increased all these uh, actions around the world 
trying to get us into uh, kinetic warfare to draw in the Soviet Union because basically to bankrupt them. And and it worked, and they drew them into Afghanistan, and the army fighting the Soviets were funded by the Americans, watch Charlie Wilson's war, and they funded the Mujahideen, one of the biggest backers and generals of the Mujahideen at the time in the 70s and 80s was Osama bin Laden, son of an oil billionaire, and they were fighting with American weapons against the Soviet Union. When they withdrew in the in the mid 80s, the Soviet Union collapsed two years later. And so then there's a fight. They just leave and the country collapses into a civil war. And the Taliban is a group that is kind of formed out of that, trying to take advantage of that power vacuum. And the group is mainly composed of Afghan religious students who studied Afghan in Afghan madrasas as well as Pakistani madrasas during their times their time as refugees um, and who had fought in the Soviet Afghan war under the leadership of Muhammad Omar. Now, Al Qaeda is different than the Taliban. They're not the same. Uh, Taliban operate. Uh, you you have different groups. Afghanistan is a country, but it is not a country in the cohesive way that we think of. Right? Like mm-hmm. Avon is next to Plainfield, is next to Brownsburg, which is next to Speedway, is next to Indianapolis. But we're all kind of the same, right? In Afghanistan, you have it's an incredibly mountainous country. You have tribes. For instance, when the Americans invaded at in 2002, there are infamous or famous stories, basically, of soldiers going to tribal people thinking and the tribal people think they're Russian because they had not heard that 15 to 20 years earlier, the Russians had left. So they just assumed the Russians were still in the country and these Americans were Russians. Uh, translators had a hard time because they were never... Uh, th- You'd have to know 25 different dialects for anybody to talk to each other. So it's incredibly, it's it's a patchwork of tribal villages. It's not a cohesive country, which has been a big reason. But Al-Qaeda is an international terrorist group that was started by Osama bin Laden out of the Mujahideen, basically to fight the Americans, the American presence in Saudi Arabia specifically. So when Dennis and his friends go into Saudi Arabia, uh, so when when Saddam Hussein of Iraq invades Kuwait, which is this oil rich country just south on the Saudi Arabian Peninsula, Osama bin Laden goes to the the Emir of Saudi Arabia and says, "Let the Mujahideen fight, fund us. We know how to fight. We're well trained. If you let the Americans in here, they will never leave." The American, the three American bases that were set up after the the Gulf War in ninety one and ninety two are still there. He was right. That's a major reason why he turned his sights towards the American government. Uh, And they had networks all through Africa and uh, the Middle East and cells around the world. And The Looming Tower is a TV show that you can watch on Hulu that kind of breaks it down. Uh, the book by the same name is great. Ali Soufan is a great author on this. All those books and all that stuff's in the in the show notes and the PDF for you to check out. Um, so, but Al Qaeda was able to host bases, training camps within Afghanistan. So, when the September 11 attacks happen under Bush, uh, they go to the Taliban and say, "Hand over Osama bin Laden," and the Taliban. I mean. They're not just going to hand them over, right? They, they, they have uh, deep ties and, and affiliations to Osama bin Laden, even if they are separate groups. They're not just going to hand him over to the United States. So they, they say, we want proof. And so that just ticked off George Bush. Um, so and this comes from Democracy Now! as they give a little bit of a brief history lesson as to what happened next turn now to look at the roots of what's become America's longest war. The U.S. invaded Afghanistan October 7, 2001, less than a month after the al-Qaeda attacks on the World Trade Center and the Pentagon. Within days of the U.S. bombing of Afghanistan, the Taliban offered to hand over Osama bin Laden, the al-Qaeda leader. But the Bush administration rejected any negotiations with the Taliban. 
This is Bush's press secretary, Ari Fleischer, responding to a question in October 2001. Would you go so far as to say that no matter what the Taliban might say at this point, it may not make any difference? Are, they, are you ignoring whatever they may say? The president could not have made it any clearer two weeks ago when he said that there will be no discussions and no negotiations. So what they say is not as important as what they do. And it's time for them to act. It's been time for them to act. In December of 2001, just a month or two later, the Taliban offered to surrender control of Kandahar if its leader, Mullah Mohammed Omar, would be allowed to, quote, live in dignity in opposition custody. U.S. Defense Secretary Donald Rumsfeld rejected the offer. If you're asking, would, would an arrangement with Omar where he could, quote, live in dignity in the Kandahar area or some place in Afghanistan be consistent with I, what I have said? The answer is no, it would not be consistent with what I have said. That's Donald Rumsfeld speaking December 6, 2001. So... Uh that leads America to invade with Operation Enduring Freedom. And then uh, let's jump to Scott Horton, his book, Enough Already. And uh, The Fool's Errand is the one to start with. And then Enough Already. Uh, Scott Horton is like the best on this stuff. He's followed this stuff forever. He's very meticulous in how he writes things. Uh, and he he's I've never interviewed him because he's interviewed on every single libertarian podcast like every other week. Um, but I'd love to talk to him because I but his best interview that I think he's ever done was just with Reason Magazine's Nick Gillespie. Uh, and it was really thorough and really worth your time listening to to get a full perspective, not just on the history, but also what happened this week and and what's going on with China and other global players and uh, definitely encourage you to go to antiwar.com, check out Scott Horton, go to the Libertarian Institute and listen to uh, Scott Horton's podcast and just that one. The rest, avoid. Uh, <laughs> um, no, foreign policy, uh, what's the one that Trisha always recommends to me, guys? Foreign policy, I don't know, it's really good too. Uh, he does a good job, but Scott Horton, uh, this is a little bit of a longer clip, but he gives kind of some more context to how things, why Osama bin Laden attacked us and what happened in the, in the days following that. Make about the reason, you know, we have obviously the motive of Al Qaeda who, you know, came out of the Mujahideen that the uh, Carter and Reagan administration had backed against the Soviets in Afghanistan in the 1980s. They were turned against us by the policies of Bush and Clinton in the 1990s, Bush Sr., I mean, and Bill Clinton in the 1990s, even though Bill Clinton kept backing them anyway, like in Chechnya and Kosovo. Um, but then, you know, they were turned against us, especially uh, first and foremost, because of the American basis in Saudi Arabia being used to continue the blockade and the bombing against Iraq there. And that was the number one cause. And there are others. But anyway, uh, but then the and, strategy... and just to put a point, just to put a point on that, that was when Bush said they hate us, George W. Bush said they hate us for our freedom. Um, it was actually, you know, plausible that uh, Al Qaeda hated us because we were we had bases in Saudi Arabia. Oh, sure. And in yeah. fact, and elsewhere throughout the world. Yeah. yeah. I mean, the most important thing that you can do is just read Osama bin Laden's declarations of war from 1996 and 1998. The first one is called Declaration of War Against the Americans Occupying the Land of the Two Holy Places. Not subtle. Um, and uh, and both of them, and then there's the letter to America that, he, that uh, the Guardian published in early 02 uh, explains all this as well. That the motive, and, and in fact, there's a, a very authoritative source, especially for right-leaning national security type folk who might be listening to this, is the former chief of the CIA's bin Laden unit, Michael Scheuer, um, who's uh, a very conservative guy and the former head bin Laden hunter at the CIA. And he said, look, these guys are religious radicals. Of course, they are the leaders of, of Al Qaeda, but they don't hate us for who we are or because of who they are. They hate us because of what we do. And in fact, Scheuer's thing was as a CIA analyst, he would be like a very objective, neutral reporter. And at least sometimes 
and say, listen, if you still want to continue these policies, that's fine. This is a democracy. Talk about it. Vote on it. Keep the policies. All I'm saying is you need to understand these policies are what's driving the terrorists war against us. Just simple as that. And very quickly, it's the bases in Saudi to bomb and blockade Iraq. Support for Israel in their occupations of Palestine and at that time also of Lebanon. Support for all the kings and dictators and sultans and El Presidentes of the region. Pressure on them to keep oil prices artificially low to subsidize our economy at their expense. And then as they accused, turning a blind eye to Russian, Chinese, Indian and Uzbek oppression of Muslims, which, as I was saying before, isn't really true because Bill Clinton was backing the Mujahideen against the Russians in Chechnya and against their friends, the Serbs in Bosnia and in Kosovo. And he was also backing Uyghur fighters against China. So, in fact, after September 11th, Bill Clinton and two of his Democratic allies from the House, Brad Sherman and Tom Lantos, all three of them said something like, how could the Muslims attack us? after everything that we've done for them lately. But the thing was, the six major reasons that they were targeting us were all still in play. And the fact that we had backed them in Kosovo did not bribe them off. But here's the real point, I'll try to wrap this up quick, is that, so that's their motive. But the strategy was to bait America into making the same mistake that the Russians had made and invade Afghanistan to bog us down, bleed us to bankruptcy, and force us out the long way and the hard way. This was the American deliberate policy against Russia. We'll give them their own Vietnam. That's not just in Rambo 3. That's Zbigniew Brzezinski, Walter Slocum, and Robert Gates in the uh, Jimmy Carter years. So this is the reason we want to back the Mujahideen in, in Afghanistan, is to provoke the Russians into invading. Then we'll bog them down and give them their own Vietnam, just as we had just suffered through and see how they like that. And then, of course, as we all know, the popular history is this is one of the straws that broke the camel's back and helped bring down the Soviet Union along with the oil price crash of the late 1980s there. Well, the Mujahideen had learned that same lesson, including the Arab Afghan army had learned that same lesson as the Reaganites and said, yeah, we did that. Right. And then they decided they're going to do the same thing to us again. And so when George Bush decided we're going to go to Afghanistan and stay, he was doing exactly what bin Laden wanted him to do. When then he went to and took out the socialist infidel, as bin Laden called him, Saddam Hussein in Baghdad, that was, as Michael Scheuer called it, a hoped for but unexpected gift to bin Laden, that he would turn Iraq, at least Western Iraq, became Jihadi University. Now then, if that's true, which it is, then when Obama went to Libya, and then to Syria and helped even to inadvertently, they weren't really going for this, create the Islamic State Caliphate that ended up invading and, and taking control over all of Western Iraq from 2014 through 2017. This is all Osama bin Laden's wildest dreams. Remember in the Bush years, Glenn Beck would threaten us with the Islamo-fascist caliphate. But then you look at a map and you go, well, where is it? Because there's all nation states in the way. There's no caliphate. Well, Bush's Iraq war and Obama's Syria war created the caliphate of bin Laden's wildest dreams and, and Glenn Beck's nightmares. All of that is all, as they say in soccer, own goal, right? None of this had to happen at all. Do um, you know So obviously you see a uh, solid interview there, uh, great stuff. And so, you know, in the in the early weeks of the the invasion of Afghanistan, I remember somebody was telling me they were they had we're in Afghanistan. They were a soldier, and they're like, "We flew in with a bunch of F-16s." And and Horton alludes to this in his, in the first chapters of his book. Flew in there with our F-16s, blew up everything that was Al Qaeda, and f we could have left. We could have walked away at that point. And you know the the numbers of Al Qaeda in the in Afghanistan went from thousands to like filling two two school buses. Uh, so you have. Uh, you have no real justification for that long-term nation-building idea. And you you have successive administrations like George Bush, you know, surges in Afghanistan. When Barack Obama, even though he runs on an anti-war platform, gets in and increases the, uh, the amount of troops in Afghanistan. Trump, when he gets into office, 
it increases it to, I think it was 12,000, 15,000 troops in Afghanistan, drops the mother of all bombs. You know, so successive presidents in kept trying to rebuild this country. And so you have basically, but the, the, there's one scene that just is perfect in cap, capturing exactly why this project did not work, why we should not have been there for 19 years because it was a fool's errand. Uh, and it's in Obama's War, a documentary by PBS and Frontline. And just just watch these guys. You have basically two sides, young soldiers and tribesmen in Afghanistan trying to communicate to each other to fulfill the, the needs or, or orders, basically, of the Taliban and the American military. And notice the general that talks in this, the guy that put this plan together, Michael Flynn, thinks Hillary Clinton eats babies. So... Obviously, we're not, we weren't coming with our best. So check this out. This is from Frontline. All the shooting makes it harder for the Marines and the people to trust one another. All right. Well, I know there's no problems, but you're still going to see the Marines around here like every day, every other day. And with a translator who doesn't speak the local dialect, or English very well. Say that over again. Fighting. The simplest communication seems impossible. Haven't gone where during fighting? <laughs> Haven't gone where during the fighting? They haven't gone to, sir. Gone where? <laughs> You're not telling me where. Where have they gone? They haven't gone to from here. They haven't gone, gone to from know. where? Gone where from here? Where? Frustration steadily grows. So now it's over there. They just said it was over there. Yeah. The Marines are here to try to find out why some locals have moved out of their homes. Why are people afraid to come back to their house? So they, now they can't come back. They know that. So they fear fighting between the towns. So the villagers are basically saying, they, we don't go to the other market because we don't want to get killed by the Taliban. Right, people can start coming back. We want people to come back to their homes. And start farming again. Hey, has anybody shopped at the market lately? The, the villagers start yeah, laughing. Oh, 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 oh. We buy our flour from another bazaar. It's a far away place. They're going to Lockery. Why are you going to Lockery? The market right here is open. It's also a Taliban told if you go to bazaar, we will kill all of you. So you were told the Taliban is going to shoot you if you go to the market. <laughs> Who told you the Taliban was going to shoot you if you go to the market? <laughs> Who? Who told you all you'd be shot if you go to the market? How well do you think your Marines understand counterinsurgency doctrine? They understand how important it is to win the population. They, they understand that. It's sometimes difficult with Marines to rein them back. Now I'm going to ask this question for the fifth time. Hey, ask him to stop. Ask him to stop. I'm going to ask this question. What I try to tell the Marines all the time is the, the, the guy that you are nice to today is going to be the guy that doesn't shoot at you or another Marine two rotations That's from an on-the-ground commander. They didn't, they didn't answer my question. Listen to me for a second. Listen to me right now, all right? You all are not cooperating. This is a war about personal relationships. It has to be a cultural shift in how we think about what we're doing. This is how we will win this war. This is how we will succeed. I need you all to answer my questions. If not, then I'm going to believe right now that the Taliban does come here. They talk to you. You talk to them. And you're still on their side. All right. You need to understand that we are here to keep the Taliban out. Translator saying is, you know, we're here to kick the Taliban out. Why aren't you helping us? They all start laughing and say, what can we do? What can we provide for you? <laughs> you have planes and tanks and guns. We're simple people with nothing. We don't even have a sword. If you can't win, then how can we? So you've got these generals who, you know, are in the Washington, D.C., like Flynn, saying, oh, my, we, we, you know, we just, it's personal relationships that will win. And then you've got this 22, 23-year-old kid condescendingly talking down to these villagers, yelling at them, saying, we're here to help you. 
what do you want us to do? They're going to kill us if we help you. And so this is why, Reinhold, the Taliban, as of last year, early, you know, it just they had 61 percent of the country. Even General Petraeus at one point says, yeah, the people on the ground prefer their their sense of justice, their organization than the completely corrupt government that we upheld. I mean, it, it's very clear what happened and why. And uh, you see it in, uh, and I'm going to find the name of that movie with Brad Pitt because it, it's based on Stanley McChrystal and uh, Hastings, Michael Hastings, who died in that mysterious car accident. And he gave an interview in Rolling Stone. He was embedded with General McChrystal during this time period. And he basically, like, McChrystal was like, Obama doesn't know what he's doing. This is not working. He, and he basically exposed to this reporter exactly what was said. And then they fired him for cursing. So they've justified a reason to fire, fire McChrystal. Um, and then the cycle just kept repeating. And the Afghan government was completely corrupt. You had Karzai who had all kinds of Swiss bank accounts and just was funneling money. The the um, the military towards the end of, of the collapse here, you know, had ghost soldiers. So it, it's like in the Sopranos when they're doing no bid jobs and like, hey, you need to give Polly three employees on that construction site you know, fake names to pay so he can get three salaries from that job. That's what was happening over there. You had you, the that's heroin. Where our money was going. Right. Go ahead, Reinhold. Oh, that's where all our money was going. I remember the big, the big days when, when they first had the vote for the government in Afghanistan, what was that? 2005, 2006, mm -hmm. maybe where they, where they all had the blue finger. Remember? Yep. Um, six, and that was that was going to be the turning point. We were going to be able to get out of Afghanistan. They have their own government now. We've got Karzai's in place. He was elected, um, and then they just saw where they could make a bunch of money and suck America dry uh, because we were willing to do that. We were in a position. We we had gotten into a position where we couldn't just leave because they would say, "Well, we, we wouldn't be able to defend ourselves against the Taliban. We don't have enough." You know, military might. We don't have enough uh, manpower. We need to get build that. So we just invested so many resources, not not just the people that we were sending over there and, and getting killed and maimed and um, put in situations where they had they had so much stress, PSTD that um, or PTSD where they were um, killing themselves. You know, I mean that's been a huge epidemic from this war. It's been an um, enormous problem this week yeah. because you, you you talk to friends who are soldiers and they're like, is my friend alive? Are they going to make it? Like they genuinely loved the, the people that were their translators or that helped them, you know, fellow Afghan soldiers from the military. And they're now, you know, in grave danger. And that's just been an added layer of trauma that probably could have been prevented uh, if the, the exit had been done better. Differently. Differently. Yeah. Go ahead, Harry. Yeah, I mean, yeah. differently. Like, even like Biden said, I was like, this was going to be chaotic, and everyone knows it's going to be chaotic. You know, everyone knew this was going to happen, but the, for some reason, they couldn't foresee it to happen that quickly, and that, you know, you could have done different things to, like, uh, well, like, we're going to, like, it was the more of the planning, and you see a lot of the generals are like, well, we had different plans. We had different plans, and this is the plan they went with. And, but everyone knew this was eventually going to happen. China knew everyone was going to eventually the Taliban was going to take back control of Afghanistan, but you know, no one knew how fast and how chaotic it was going to be. And it's not even how you say, like, it's only that chaotic as people like may even make it out to be even not right there on the, on the floor. Like the Taliban is, is not really like right now, like just butchering people's, you know, butchering people. They're more just telling you, you got to get the heck out. You need to leave. Right. Yeah. And, well, the, the, the bad part is, is that, I think a lot of their planning and thought process was under the impression that um, they, they just must understood what was going to happen, be, what what the reaction to uh, of the Afghan people is going to be, because they see the United States leaving. And I think I think the uh, leadership and even the past administration felt the same way, probably that uh, once we leave, they'll be able to stand up for themselves and they'll at least put up some, you know, some sort of fight to keep their country and they didn't they just rolled over and it's a lesson they did not learn from vietnam where the same thing happened um where uh, as we started pulling out a lot of the south vietnamese military defected 
because they they knew they were going to get overrun and they wanted to be on the good side, you know, the side that was going to win because they didn't want to get tortured and killed uh, for being part of the enemy. So we, uh, and, and, you know, it was a great uh, podcast yesterday from uh, Bruce Carlson on the, um, uh, my history can beat up your politics podcast where he we'll details some us. of that. Who will be with us on Friday, by the way. Right. And the great, one of the great things that came out that I heard in that was um, one of the interesting things I heard about that was that they had planned to take off on planes out of Vietnam, Vietnam, um, and it affecting um, South Vietnamese officer or pilot dropped his payload on the uh, runway and destroyed it as yeah. he was flying over to uh, defect. And he wanted so to that do kept it. Us from, yeah. It wanted to get, he wanted to get in good with the people that were about to take over his country. They right. actually had operation baby lift. They had operation new life. They had operation fresh, fresh wind. They had multiple operations, but we're going to get into uh, the fall of Saigon and the parallels there in the, uh, episode on friday and we're going to talk more about the the disaster that was this past uh month in afghanistan and and what are we to think about it even though we are opposed to the long war and we are opposed and we were for exiting afghanistan what happened could have been done differently and we will talk about that tomorrow so please stay tuned here on the chris spangle show Thank you for listening. And if you got something, if you got some value out of this, please share it with your friends. We're not trying to make you mad. We're just trying to make you think here at the Chris Spangle Show. We'll see you tomorrow.